have seen the presentation before, so I hope you're, you can stand it again. Uh, there's a lot of information in the presentation that uh, you're probably familiar with, and, and um, hopefully there's information here that you're not familiar with, and it, and it will help you get prepared for what's coming in uh, 2022. Um, and as Earl said, I, I was the National Geodetic Survey Advisor to, to Florida. I followed Ronnie Taylor, um, and uh, that was a great experience to be able to follow him because he was here for so many years. Um, when I give my presentations, I like to keep them informal. Since I'm giving a lot of detailed information, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and, and I'll try to answer the question right away rather than wait till the end because sometimes it, things get lost if, as I go along. Uh, the presentation is going to take um, about an hour, um, so we're going to talk about new datums and old datums and where we came from and where we're going. Um, without a datum, we can make nice, pretty maps, but that's all we've got is a map. You don't have any established, any established place to put your coordinates if you're not on some datum. And there's so many different datums that um, I think it's important that we, we talk about what's the basis for the datums, um, where those datums, some of those datums have been, and where we're, where we're going to go. The NSRS, or the National Spatial Reference System, is the basis for the current datum as, that Matt mentioned, is, which is NAD 83-2011, EPIC 2010.00. And the core stations are the basis for the NSRS. NGS is going to rely more and more on the core stations. In fact, that's pretty much what they rely on now. As you know, they haven't, NGS hasn't put a monument in the ground in years. That's not what they do anymore. The, the advisor position was called mark maintenance originally. And that's what that guy did. He went out and, and um, maintained the marks. NGS doesn't do that anymore. The only, and the only people that do that now are individuals or governments that want something in the ground, or they need something in the ground. I, talking to, to Richard, you know, apparently there's, it's important to have monuments in the ground so you can get insurance reductions. Is that, is that right, Richard? Yeah. You get the, from the FEMA. portion of the, uh, does anybody know about the CRS, the Community Rating System for the FEMA? Government surveyors um, with FEMA, you know, it's a big component for the upcoming, which our five-year uh, period will be not this coming up year, but the following year. And there's a horizontal component with our vertical network. Uh, everyone gets credit ratings for that. And there's going to be a horizontal component. We're actually working on uh, working on a horizontal network as we speak because of it. So there, there's still a, a reason to put monuments in the ground or have them in the ground, even though the people at the National Geodetic Survey don't see a reason for it, but there's, there are reasons outside of, of their purview that we need monuments in the ground. Um, but those monuments move, and what happens to them? And, and those are things that you have to keep in mind when you're trying to, to work to a certain datum. So does anybody have any questions before we start? Okay. Um, Today we're going to talk about some terminology. We're going to get started with terminology. I'm going to just give you an overview of what's on the horizon, some history of datums, where, where we came from, what is a datum, you know, what, what's important about it, are we ready for these new datums, and then a couple of examples, and then of course some questions and answers, but as I said, please feel free to ask a question as we go along. So before we get started, I think we need to define some things. And a horizontal datum will no longer exist. It will now be called a geometric reference frame. And it will be uh, geocentric. Um, and that is coordinates and then are going to be converted to latitude, longitude, and ellipsoid height. But in order for us to use a vertical, we're not interested in things on the ellipsoid, we really need to, to put into that a geoid. We have to get off the mathematical ellipsoid and get on to some surface that, that is difficult <coughs> to define, and we call that the geoid. So once we get on the geoid, then we can create a, a vertical datum, 
but that will now, it will not be called a vertical datum anymore, it will be called a geopotential reference frame. And that's going to be gravity. What we have now is a hybrid geoid. It's done with gravity, some gravity measurements, it's done with some um, GPS measurements, it's done with some leveling. So all these things are put together to create geoid, now geoid 12B. 12A is basically, 12A and 12B are the same in the continental United States. 12B basically applies to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands because there were some errors there and they had to, but they, now everything is 12B. The, it does, so it doesn't matter whether you, in Florida whether you use 12A or 12B, they're exactly the same. So this is going to be, the geopotential reference frame is going to be completely gravity. That's coming in 2022. In order to make that correct, in order to get as good a geoid as we can, we have to put it, take into consideration geoid undulation to create this orthometric height, but we also have to take, take into consideration deflection of the vertical. Now these things are that go on behind the scenes, but they're things that you should understand. So still talking terminology, this shape is our um, reference for NAD83 and the uh, GPS system. Both horizontal and vertical coordinates originate on this surface. And the, the Pythagorean concept of a spherical earth offers uh, a simple reference frame, which is we can work on uh, from a mathematical standpoint. And while the sphere closely approximates that of the true figure of the earth, um, it works satisfactorily for many purposes, but we need to squash the sphere at the poles, and then we put that figure in revolution, and that's what really creates what we use <coughs> as what is called the reference elusive. So there are relationships between this reference ellipsoid and various uh, geopotential surfaces. The, they're represented here by the dashed blue lines. Those are all geopotential surfaces. But the one that we're most interested in is the solid blue line, which NGS defines as the geoid. And that's, that's currently called uh, 12A. Now, it, it approximates mean sea level. It's not really mean sea, level, mean sea level, but it approximates mean sea level. Okay, now that gets some of the terminology out of the way. Uh, we can see from this picture that vertical is not truly perpendicular to the ellipsoid, but it's perpendicular to the geoid. So when you measure this perpendicular distance, you're not, it's not really truly that distance. The formula h equals h plus n is familiar to us when we're using uh, GPS, but it's not exactly true because we have to take into account this deflection of the vertical, which is perpendicular to the geoid instead. So with these definitions out of the way, what's coming? In 2022, we're going to get new a new horizontal datum and a new vertical datum. Um, we, yeah, we just changed from Force 96 or in, you know, in, to NAD 83 2011. We just did that. So why are we talking about new datums? Well, we have to think about the new datums now because you guys as surveyors know that if you submit something to some governmental body, you're required to do it in, in something that they have set in an ordinance. Their ordinance says, you will supply us coordinates in this data. Well, <coughs> how long does it take that governmental body to change those regulations? It, some, some, right. some are still working in NAD 27. And how long have we had NAD 83? So it's time to start to think now about getting these things in place so that when we finally get there, everybody's going to move along in the same, in the same direction. Um, the realization of the new data is going to be through GNSS receivers. It's not going to be monuments in the ground anymore. Um, Manatee County just did a large project of upgrading their whole system. And they put a lot of monuments in the ground. 
there are probably more monuments in Manatee County than there are in some states. They just disappear. When I was the NGS advisor, um, I may have gotten two or three calls a month, maybe, about somebody that found a monument and it, it was going to be destroyed. Most of them just get wiped out. A lot of the vertical monuments you can't even find anymore because the, the horizontal positions on them were just a guess. So you, you don't even know where they are. The horizontal work that was done with triangulation is excellent. You can, you can find those, but the vertical, in from some of the vertical monuments, you can go look for them for a long time and just never find them. And some say they're on one side of the road and they actually end up on the other side of the road or something because somebody made a mistake. So monuments are going, are going to, they're, they're going to go away. Um, <coughs> the money to, to put monuments in the ground is going to go away. So we're going to have to rely more and more on GNSS in order to, to figure out where we are and, and on, on the core stations. And NGS is, has already written the tools to transform between new datums and old datums, and we'll see a little bit about this um, later. And I will take a break in a second. Um, how are the, these, new, these new datums going to affect you? Um, this isn't going to be a minor change. Those of you that know the dip, that have been around and still deal with the difference between 27 and 83, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a 1.6 meter shift in the ellipsoid. And it's not a shift where you go this much X and this much Y and you just apply it. It doesn't work that way. It's a shift, the whole ellipsoid is going to shift on the, the international terrestrial reference frame. So it's going to be a horizontal and a vertical shift that's going to affect every horizontal and vertical coordinate in the state. So it's something that you really, um, you really need to start to think about now. The, the new geopotential datum will change heights on the average of 50 centimeters. Now, it's not necessarily the, the geoid that's going to cause these changes, but it's this shift in ellipsoid that's going to cause the changes. The geoid is really pretty good in Florida. It, as you get further west, you can see you've got a meter change going on. But here in Florida, we don't have much of a problem. And, and since the geoid is so good, the new one is going to work just as well, the, the gravity geoid. So there'll be some changes, but it's not going to be big for as far as the geoid goes. But when you take into account the shift in the ellipsoid, now you've got a vertical shift also. So before I go on to this, let's get some pizza. Yep. And uh, so get something to eat, get something to drink, and then I'll continue. Talk around you, it's not, not a problem for me. Uh, so now that I have your attention, let's back up a little bit. Uh, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, and, and uh, when I began surveying, that was a couple of years ago, um, right around 1963. Um, we didn't worry about data. We started with 10,000, 10,000, we pounded a railroad spike in a telephone pole and called it a thousand and off we went and did our survey. It wasn't something that we, we were concerned about, but we dreamed about this black box. That Pennsylvania is a meets and bounds state, right? So we didn't have to worry about public lands and all that other stuff. So, we, we thought, oh, we need this black box because I'm tired of cutting line and pulling the 300-foot tape and doing all this other stuff. Um, so along came the beetle. Oh, wait. This beetle. Um, that measured distances. And we thought, well, this is great. You know, I mean, now we don't, we don't have to pull a tape. We can, we can measure distances electronically. But we still didn't have, and we, but we still didn't have to worry about data. And then Hewlett Packard came along and built. This was a 3805. They also had a 3810, which had a vernier on it. And so you could not only measure distances, but you could measure angles. And I owned one. It was great. It was a magic tool as far as I was concerned because we could get a lot more work done a lot faster. Then came the 3820, which was one of the most compact 
machines that was on the market at the time. Um, and in fact, this, when HP decided to get out of the surveying business, that's what Charlie Trimble and his cohorts bought when they moved over and, and started Trimble. They bought the surveying technology and the navigation technology from HP. So several other manufacturers got in, of course, got in the business as, as time went on. And we were still saying, OK, what can we do to get us around the woods? Why, or, or around the swamp instead of having to go through it. Well, GPS came along. Okay, now we have our black box, but one of the problems is now we have to start to worry about data. It's really important now that we have GPS and we have to, to start to worry about data because now we've got not only two dimensions, but now we're getting all three dimensions at the same time. It wasn't until Course 96 that NGS started to use um, an actual three-dimensional geometric data. It was a horizontal data and a vertical data. But along with Course 96, um, it was now a geometric data, a three-dimensional. As a surveyor, we still considered these things fixed in space. Here's a datum, it's fixed in space, but we know that's not really the case. These things move. The tectonic plates are moving, so it's, things are going up and down. They're moving horizontally. So they change. And, and now there's a fourth dimension that includes velocities. So velocities have to be taken into account at the same time. So we have these geodetic datums, um, two-dimensional horizontal, one-dimensional vertical, and then the three-dimensional geometric data. But now we have to take into this fourth, this fourth dimension, which is a velocity that has to, that you have to consider as you go along. And when you get actually, if you if you submit your data to to Opus, if you take enough data to submit to Opus, Opus takes into consideration the velocity when they present the solution back to you. You will see the epic on there. The epic will be today or tomorrow or whenever you take the data. So the velocity is taken into account. Not only that, but here in Florida, what's also taken into account and is important to us is ocean load for the vertical. So Opus provides ocean loading when they give you the solution. Because that can make, especially when you, know, when you get near the coast like we are here, things can go up and down just due to, to the tide. So these are, this is where we are now and what, what's happening. We use, why, what's a geometric datum? Well, we, we use these datums to pl place ourselves somewhere on the Earth. What, you know, and as noted on the previous slide, modern, modern datums have to include all four dimensions. The ellipsoid for NAD83 and WGS84, thank you, are almost the same. They're not quite the same, but they're almost the same. And so if the difference would cause I don't even remember, a couple millimeters from Alaska to Florida. So it's, it's, there isn't a big difference between WGS84 and NAD83. However, the difference right, that we're going to be concerned about is that NAD83 is considered a local data, while WGS84 is a global data. So that's the difference between the two. So what about NAD83? Well, the original um, realization was was instituted in 1986. NAD83 hasn't changed. It's still the same datum it was in 1986. There have been different realizations of NAD83, but the basic datum itself hasn't changed. Then the Harns were done in the 90s. And when the Harns were done, they were done with GPS. But what happened was they took the, these very accurate GPS measurements and they warped them to the monuments that were in the ground. So now you have something that when you go out with your GPS receiver, you can hit the monument because it's, the, it's been shaped to fit what's on the ground. Well, that's, that's what's going to go away. We're no longer trying to fit the monuments on the ground. It's the core station that the data is going to fit. And it's going to be the core stations as 
they, they are moving. When, uh, right before 2010, Epic, well, Epic 2010 was where it was set, but right before 2011 came out, NGS did a massive adjustment of all the course data from 1994 up until Epic 2010.00. And they adjusted all of that data at once. Well, the, the result of that was they know how fast and in what directions the course stations are moving. That's what information it gave them. So now they know how fast these, these stations are moving and they know in what directions they're moving. So, that was what happened prior to NAD 83 2011, and then NAD 83 2011 was fit to that course data. So that's kind of the, the, how that all fit together. So the National Readjustment of 2007, or course 96, was based on Epic 2002.00. That was a nationwide adjustment, but it was only GNSS. It, it didn't take into consideration the, the monuments in the ground. Then NED 83 2011 took into consideration some 80,000 monuments or something. And all of those were adjusted at the same time. But the problem with that adjustment is a lot of it was based on very old data. So yes, they were adjusted, and yes, it says NED 83 2011 on it, but how old was the data that was used to, to when was it last visited? When did somebody last update that information? So that's a problem with NAD 83 2011 and monuments in the ground at the same time. But the thing to keep in mind is that this is not a new data. It's still NAD 83. It's a different what's called realization of that. So. The original realization of NAD 83 was completed in 1987, just like NAD 88 wasn't available until 1990 or something. I mean, it takes a while. You name one thing and then, and, and it's NAD 83 2011, but that wasn't available until the middle of 2012. So hopefully when 2022 comes, we'll, NGS will get it out at the right time. But um, WGS 84 in the meantime has gone through the, all these different realizations and I'm not I'm, I'm pretty sure this is up to date at G 1762 but I'm not sure but the 17 books the 1762 is the GPS week that's what that means so there were adjustments at week 730 873 and so on um, as WGS 84 was revised and what happened was the, the center of the Earth was better known because there was more satellite information and more satellites going around the Earth. So the WGS84 ellipsoid moved as the center of the Earth moved, as we knew, got better information about it. NAD83 stayed here, so WGS84 drifted away. And currently is about 1.6 meter difference. So basically what's going to happen is this ellipsoid called NAD83 in 2022 is all of a sudden going to go boom, down onto ITRF. And that's what you, you, you've got to be concerned about. I remember when um, NED83 came out, there was a picture in the Washington Post, I think, of, of the time, like a time-lapse picture of the Washington Monument moving across the page. So, well, you know, obviously that's but that's not what happens, but that's the kind of, that's what you're going to see in, in essence. So why change datums and realizations? Well, NAD 80, or NAD 27 was based on old observations and on an old system. So I, I was in Apalachicola a couple of years ago and was looking for a monument that hadn't been found since 1934. And I was using RTK and it was happened to be the F dot system, and I went up like this, and I was looking you know, through the bushes and everything, and I went chunk, and it was under the earth about that far, and I hit right on top of it. Now I don't know where I hit because there, you know there were some, they were only they they might have been ten feet tall, real thin stuff, so I could still get a relatively good signal, but I hit right on the monument from 1934. 
So obviously, the work that was done by the triangulation people was really, really good. And, and so what, when, when we upgrade, some of the stuff was upgraded really well to the new one, NAD 8386. But again, it was based on those older observations that people hadn't been to. This monument I was just talking about, nobody visited it since 1934. There was no record that anybody, it was put in the ground, it was, it was measured, and nobody ever went back to find it. So it was, it was old stuff. Um, then the Harns again, and then AD 396 was based on better observations, but it was still the same system. And NSRS 2007, <coughs> were, there were some new observations, it got rid of some of the distortions, but not all of them, and made it consistent with the course. And then AD 83-2011 came along. Now we had a lot of new observations. <coughs> if you look at a map of all the things that were done in that adjustment, it's just like a big spaghetti pile of spaghetti or so many observations. But it's still the same system, but it was kept consistent with this update of the course of the course station. So, now what's a vertical data? Well, it's just some surface that somebody chooses to say, this is my data, like my spike in the, in, the, in the telephone pole. That was my data. I called it a thousand. Okay, that was my data. Well, it's some, somebody that says this is a, it is a zero elevation. And, and what we choose is uh, the mean sea level as close as we can approximate it. So it's a system for determining height from, from this zero elevation. And it's comprised of two different elements. There's a definition, which is it's what this the, the defined geoid, and then it's its realization, which it currently is geoid 12B. That's the realization of, of this defined geoid that we have. So there were datums prior to uh, NGVD 29. Uh, in fact, the first leveling project was done by the Coast Survey in um, 1856 to 1857. Uh, and then you can see there the transcontinental leveling was in, again in Hagerstown, the one across. And we'll look in a minute at, at some of what, of what was done. Um, there are other datums that are available. Some people still use them. Um, but NGS doesn't try to get you from 27 backwards. They can get you from 27 to, to 88 and, and back and forth, but not, they don't go back any further than that. The 29 was originally called the sea level datum of 1929, and as I'm sure a lot of you know, it was based on 26 different tide gauges. But the tide gauges weren't all put together. And, and so they weren't all in the same tidal epic, which is about 19 years. So it caused some differences. And again, just like with the horns, the, the vertical data was worked to fit the information that was there. And so since it's, it, didn't re it wasn't really a sea level data, they changed it and, and it was called the National Geodetic Vertical Data. So, Mean sea level, as I've said, is a, is a close approximation of um, the geoid. And so these are the 26 tide gauges that um, were originally used in, in that data. So, and as you know now, uh, we've gone on from the 26 tide gauges and we've gone to um, the new NAVD8, NAVD88 data. Uh, but again, it's the surface of equal gravity potential to which orthometric heights shall refer in North America. This is a definition. And it's 6.271 meters along the plumb line from the geodetic mark at Father Point. And so now instead of using 26 points or 26 tide gauges, we use one. And its realization in this case is over 500,000 geodetic marks across North America. Um, one of the problems, though, is that when you fix that point, then you can get a buildup of errors across the United States. And we saw that earlier on that, on that slide where there's a one meter buildup as you went across 
the U.S. So, there, but there, there were a couple of reasons to fix it here was there's, an, there's another datum called the International Great Lakes Data, which is a, an agreement between the U.S. and Canada about the, the data that's around the Great Lakes. So this point was chosen to try and fix that and to make those two very close together. So that was another reason to choose just one point. Uh, so NAVD 88 is fixed at Father Point. Uh, it was also chosen to minimize these differences between 29 and 88, and along with the International Great, uh, Great Lakes data. Uh, since sea level isn't the same ever, any, everywhere, uh, NGVD 29 suffered from time to those 26 uh, tide stations. So NAVD 88 solved that problem, but it didn't allow for that error buildup as you go across the U.S. So if we look at it again in another way, here we have NGVD 29 and, and the, everything was tied together all the way across the U.S. and then balanced um, across the U.S. Then you have NAVD 88, uh, which is referenced to one point in Canada. And again, you can see there are some distortions as you go along. And then you can see the differences here. They, it, these really aren't differences between NABD88 and NGVD29, but it's, it's a representation of, of what happened when, when we changed the datums from one to the other or how some of the things changed. So why isn't NABD88 good enough anymore? Well, you can see here what happens to, to some of the some of the benchmarks. I mean, they, they the ground sinks. The ground sinks over there. I can't I don't remember what that is. Fifty some feet or something up there. I think fifty seven feet. I think that says. So things uh, things go up and down. And then again, you know, you you lose monuments like this. They get torn out. They just disappear. Uh, it's really it's really a big problem because the monuments are disappearing faster than they can be put in the ground. In Florida, we're currently lucky. FD, uh, DP puts, puts vertical monuments in the ground all the time. But they do it because they get money from somebody else. Somebody else pays the bill. DP doesn't do it with their own money. So if somebody says, one of the water districts, or somebody says, come, says I need this stuff done, Will you do it? So they do it. Um, Manatee County, I know, hired a, a lot of different surveyors to do the work for them, run the levels, put the monuments in the ground, and everything. So there's a there is work going on, but eventually that money's going to run out, and then the, the information is just going to disappear as as time goes on. So they're not funded for replacement. Um, one of the other problems is. Um, there's nothing in Alaska. Alaska just is very devoid of any kind of uh, monumentation. NEVD 88 wasn't adopted in Canada. There's negotiations still going on. And perhaps when we get to 2022, everybody will agree. I don't know. Um, and then again, the cross country buildup. So this is an approximate level of, of geoid mismatch between. Uh, NAVD 88 in this uh, <coughs> surface. And as you can see, as you go across it, there is a buildup of air. But in Florida, we're relatively lucky. There isn't much, there isn't much of a difference. Um, there's uh, a gravimetric geoid. Uh, that's the, if you look at the NGS webpage, or those are the GG models. That's a, that's a gravimetric geoid. And then there's geoid 12A and geoid 12B. Um, but that's defined by gravity. That sits in the geoid, and it's refined by terrain models and in some other scientific and app, uh, applications. As I said earlier, we use a hybrid geoid right now. Uh, it's it's the, uh, gravity's input to it as much as they have uh, GPS on benchmarks. Those of you that have done four hours of observations and submitted them to the to NGS, some of that data gets used. If, if there have been more than one observation on, on that particular monument, then NGS looks at it and says, okay, do we want to include this in the geoid? So any information like that that gets submitted to NGS, they try to look at. Um, but 
it, again, it's worked, to, it's worked to fit the GPS on benchmarks at the same time. So it's not a true one geoid of one kind. And that's what the gravimetric geoid is going to solve. And this is what I was talking about earlier. It's, it's statutory for some surveying and mapping applications where somebody has said, you will give me this data in an AVD-88. When in reality, what's, what in my opinion, what ordinances ought to say is you will give us this information in the latest NGS datum. <coughs> and that way it kind of goes with the flow. When NGS changes the datum, then the spec changes automatically. But, it's, but that's not the way, unfortunately, that's not the way ordinances are written. Um, lawyers like to be real specific about things, and so I'm sure that enters into it at the same time. So which geoid do we use for NAD83? Or for which version of NAD83? So NAD83 2011, you're going to use geoid 12A or 12B. And if you're in Puerto Rico or Virgin Islands, you're going to use 12B. If you're using NAD83 2007, then you use geoid 09. Now, somebody, you know, why, why is, what's the difference? Well, there's not a lot of difference between 09 and 12. But the, the geoid is tied to a specific latitude and longitude. And, and between NAD 83 2011 and, and 2007, the latitude and longitude at that point changed. So you have to use the geoid that was set for that particular time, if you're going to be exactly right. It gets a little sketchier <coughs> when you get back to geoid 03, 99, and 96. So, it's a, little, it's a little bit more important when you get back further to use the right ellipsoid for the right, with the right geoid. And then for when you get back more toward the harms than any D392, you want to use geoid 93. So, new datum. What's being replaced? Well, right now you should be using one of these, depending on where you are in, in the world. And you should also be using one of these, depending on where, where you are in the world and, and what you're doing with. Um, so, but this is what's being replaced. The horizontal and the vertical datums are, are going to be replaced. NAD83 was, was theoretically ge geocentric, um, and as, was G, uh, as is WGS84, but <coughs> both were based on the best available technology at that time. When, when GPS started. I started in GPS in 1980, 84, 85, I don't, I don't remember. There was a, I remember there was an international GPS conference in Rockville, Maryland in 1985, and I remember attending that. So it was sometime before that that I actually got, got involved with GPS. So at that point, these two things were the same. And it was you, N883, WGS84, it didn't matter. Well, at that point, it was WGS72. So it was even older than that. But then 84 came along. So, um, so as I said, over the years, with the more satellite data and more satellite available, the, the center of the Earth has been refined. And, and, and it's known more, better and better where the center of gravity is. And, and that has gradually shifted. So in 2022, then, um, there are going to be two new reference frames. Or well, actually, there's going to be one because it's going to be a geometric reference. Frame. But somewhere around 2020, IGS will create a, a new reference frame, and then NGS will base these their new reference their new data on that reference frame, whatever that is. So old datums use passive control, passive control are monuments in the ground, active con control in the core station. That's the way NGS defines it. So passive control is something that you can get to on the ground and then, and then um, active control is the core stations. And so the old datums use this passive control. And the cores and opus help that, but, but data sheets by far remain the biggest download from NGS. But remember, when you download a data sheet, look at the EPIC. The EPIC is 2010.00 if it was updated within AD83. Not, not all the points in the database were updated. So you have to look at the EPIC. Now, 
what what is today the second of October 2015 the data on that data sheet is almost six years old that point is not there anymore now is it enough as a surveyor for you to worry about you have to make that decision but just keep in mind that when you download that data sheet that's not where that point is it's moved horizontally and vertically. Okay, so the new datums are now, are, the primary access is going to be GNSS plus a GNSS. That's how you're going to get your positions. Secondary access is going to be passive control. So you may, ha you may use um, passive control for uh, your monitoring a datum or you set passive control on this project so it's going to last you a couple of years and you want to be able to go back to it so it's there and you know it. But that's going to be secondary access. And But what's going to be fixed are the cores plus the GOA. Because the cores are up to date taking into consideration the velocities and everything else of the movement. So they are up to date. Okay, so what's passive control going to be in the future? As I said, it's going to be for a project, it's going to be for monitoring, it's going to be things like that. But again, I'll go back to Florida's lucky because there is, a, at this point, at least there's a lot of vertical control. Horizontal control is kind of disappearing to a certain extent, but the vertical, there's more vertical control being put in the ground. But it will eventually disappear. As roads get widened and things just things get built, most of the original NGS controls hard to find. But there are other states where it just doesn't exist at all. So old versus new data. The old way we had a data sheet, and you 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 know when you look at the data sheet and you go back here to superseded survey control. The superseded control wasn't due to to actual movement, it was due to a new realization in most cases of, of NAD 83. It, was, it, it was adjusted, so you, everything was moved to superseded. And that data, as we saw earlier, is it goes unchecked, it's fragile, it can move. So the new way now is going to be GNSS from the core stations, it's going to take into account this gravimetric geoid that will be produced and is in the process of being produced. And it will be kept up to date via satellite gravimetric measurements. So that, as you know, gravity doesn't remain stable either. But so that geoid will be revised through, grav through satellite measurements. And then there'll be a new data sheet. If you download um, the data sheets now from Opus, what do they call it? Opus, not Opus database. <coughs> I can't remember. You mean DS World? Or? No, if you, uh, from the secondary. Oh. NGS has two databases. One where you get the traditional data sheet and one where somebody's done four hours worth of work on a, on a point. If you download that data, that data sheet right now, you'll get a data sheet that looks like this, but then eventually they'll all look like that. So, this is what's coming. So what about data sheets or, or how valuable are they going to be? Well, if you have a point if you have a point that has at least four measurements on it, then you can use a linear regression to put a line through it. And then you can also add uncertainties to it. <coughs> so if there's a if a data sheet has or a point has four measurements on it, then you can create this sort of thing and go backwards and forwards. <clears throat> and NGS will provide those kinds of tools so that you can do that. So you can make these kinds of estimates of what, of where that point actually should be or what the elevation actually was. So this is what, that's just a simplified concept of what um, we're looking at here. Uh, there's the NAD83 origin over here, and then the ITRF, whatever it is, origin there. And as I said, 
Currently, it's about 1.6 meters difference between the two. Well, what's going to happen is this. They're going to move, and then they're going to be put together. And so if you just think about it, you think about what the, what's happening. If this is your, this is your elevation now, <coughs> then that's going to, this is going to be your elevation in the future, that the point hasn't moved. So that's what we're going to be taking into consideration. And at the same time as that moves, you're moving your horizontal. One of the things that's coming up, um, you know, when we when the change was made from NAD 27 to NAD 83, the coordinates changed by large amounts. So that there was an obvious difference. NGS is going to make those decisions themselves, unless you as a as a group, as FSMS, or, or you have real feelings about what where those coordinates should start or where the zero zero origin should be then NGS will make the decision. If you have strong feelings, you should go through this group, the GNSS users group, or at least through FSMS and consolidate those opinions and send them to NGS. Because NGS doesn't care. I mean, that, you know, they'll set whatever FSMS wants them to set if there's enough concern. So if you have a concern, express it. You know, let them know. Um, they are also going to create the state plane information um, at the same time. So state plane projections will still be available. Um, right now, the gravity is being done by airborne gravity. And that coverage is going to be all of this <coughs> by 2022. That's the goal. The project is called Gravity, gravity, gravity for the Redefinition of the North American vertical data, or the American vertical data, actually. So, right, um, that's a huge project, and and originally it was supposed to be done in 2018. It's been pushed to 2022 due to funding, because you've got to fly all of these areas. Much of it, well, not much of it. A lot of the coastline, Puerto Rico, a lot of Alaska, has already been flown. Um, so, a lot of it's already done. What kind of a geoid or how accurate a geoid can you produce by flying? And what NGS did was they, they ran this um, uh, geoid slope validation survey from Corpus Christi to Austin. And this is the information that they, they gathered when they did it. They did differential leveling campaign style GPS. In other words, you know, several receivers out at the same time. RTN-based GPS, absolute gravity, gravity gradients, deflections of the vertical, airborne LIDAR, airborne imagery, and, and the gravity had already been flown. So they did all of this, this to prove that they could produce a one centimeter geoid. Now you, you're going to get very accurate ellipsoid heights from GNSS. NGS can now or will be able to produce a one centimeter geoid. So you should be able to get and rely on one to two centimeters for an elevation. They're currently run, or they, well, last year in 14, they actually ran one in, in Iowa. Why Iowa? Well, Texas was near, near sea level. Iowa was up, I don't know, how many thousands of feet from sea level. So, but also relatively flat. And now they're, they're, they're probably run one more in the mountains, just to prove that, they, that this one centimeter geoid is valid everywhere. If you look at uh, this, the results from uh, GSVS 11, the 14's not done yet, the calculations aren't done yet. But if you look at 11, this is the kind of things, the errors that you see until you add in uh, geodes without gravity data, give you this kind of error. And that's uh, RMS error over there on the left, and um, dis I think distant, uh, days of the year down here on the right, or distances down here on the, on the x-axis. So those are the kinds of errors that you see. If you add in all of the information that was gathered and, and the 
try to prove that gravity could do the job, now you see <coughs> one centimeter differential accuracy over distances from 0.4 to 325 kilometers. So it's going to get to the point where you can actually rely on GNSS to give you good vertical information. Remember this slide from earlier, so keep that in mind as we go further here. What does done look like? Well, currently, um, NGS already has a version of Opus that will produce coordinates in the new geometric reference frame. Now, obviously, they, since that reference frame hasn't been created yet by IGS, they don't know what it is, but they have all the math put together that they just to plug in the new, whatever the parameters of the new IGS reference ellipsoid is, and they'll come up with the, this new information. So you even get a new height at the same time from that information. In addition, um, they already have information on NAD 83 2011 and it's for a transfer transformation tool to go from NAD 83 2011 to the new geo geometric reference frame and back and forth. So that tool already exists. If you've been around a while, you know that NGS usually lags with their tools. They bring out a new datum and then they lag with the tools to be able to convert from one to another. Well, this information is already done. So it's not something there that you need to worry about as a survey. Also, um, elevations. There's a tool already exists to transform from NAD or NABD88 to whatever this new geopotential reference frame is. So that tool already exists. So NGS is pretty much ready, and they could actually do it now if they had this new gravity geo. The holdup is the gravity information that needs to be flown. As I said, right now, much of the interior of the U.S. is not done. So all around the Great Lakes is done. Some of Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and around the perimeter. Florida is done because it's almost all coastline and all, most of the coastline. The important part about it, all this is that the Federal Geodetic Control Subcommittee has approved all of this. And that's the really important part because they control everything. They're the ones that give their blessing to whether anything gets done or not, but they've approved it, so that's what's important. Um, so how are you going to access this new data? Well, as I said earlier, you're going to access it with GNSS. Um, you're going to um, get an ellipsoid height, and then you're going to add the geoid, and that's going to give you your elevation. So you don't need passive marks anymore. Passive marks make everybody feel comfortable. It gives you something to check into. It, it makes you feel better. But when they disappear and you don't have them anymore, then you're just going to have to trust me. <laughs> no. So how are you going to access the new data? Well, you're going to get an ellipsoid height, this eight, little h, from NGS. And then you're going to subtract and you're going to uh, take the geoid model and remove that model, and that's going to give you your orthometric height. So that's how it's going to, that's how it's going to work. It's still h equals h, h, in this case, h plus n, or h minus n, but it's still going to be h equals h plus n. That's how it's going to work. So your secondary access is going to be primary, or passive corners. But with nobody maintaining them and nobody doing anything, why? Uh, it, they're going to disappear. Um, yes, people still do blue booking right now, but I don't anticipate that continuing for very long. Um, even NGS was wondering at some point whether they needed to um, just not bother blue book with blue booking. So, and that's the only way points ever get into the database. So, there's going to be a data sharing service for these points. Um, and, but that's what's in that other, that secondary NGS database, are those points that have been shared. Um, a conversion is going to be provided between the, the datums. Um, only when, where recent geo ellipsoid heights exist can uh, make it, but make that change and make it reliable 
from the old to the new. So how are you going to access this new vertical data? Well, here you have a typical flood insurance survey. And the benchmark was put in in 1954, boom, this. And then you have subsidence. And the subsidence is going to affect the house and the benchmark. So that's your published type. But that's the true height. So if you submit that, you're obviously wrong. Because it's not there anymore. So if you use the existing techniques and you've got that published height, you find the benchmark, you get the published height, you level from the benchmark, it doesn't take into account for subsidence, and so you're obviously wrong. So what happens if in the future? Well, you find a benchmark, or you set up one. You use your GNSS and OPUS, or some other processing technique. You get the orthometric height. You level from the benchmark, and now you're right. That's how it's going to work. And if you, if you really trust, and I do, the one centimeter geoid, then this is going to work. you'll have an accurate height. What happens if you need to bring in something from someplace far away? Well, as you all know, as surveyors, it's you find a benchmark somewhere and you level in. If you have to level in, that gets really expensive. And then you can't trust that because you only have one benchmark. You don't know what's happened. So now you have to level out to a, to a new set of, of lines and then you have to level between those benchmarks. And now it's really getting expensive. So then you can either blue book the data and submit it because you've spent all that time doing it, or you can just go ahead and use the data. And that's assuming everything works, and it doesn't always work. Uh, you could use a height mod survey. Okay? You're familiar with height mod surveys. You, you kind of work your way into the center progressively from outside using GPS. And you work your way in setting up on the different monuments, and eventually you get to survey the monument you want. And then again, you can blue book it or just use the data that you have. But again, it assumes that the published heights are correct to begin with. And you don't know that unless, I mean, here you would at least have some check on it. And, and with the previous example, you would level in and level out, and you'd have some check on it. OK, once GravD is done and 2022 comes along, then what happens? Well, you set up a GPS receiver over the mark, you submit the data to Opus, and you're done. Now, if you, if you take two hours worth of data, rather than level for two days, yeah, two hours is a long time. But it sure beats leveling for two days, or doing some kind of GPS campaign where you're running three or four sessions at two hours a piece. So that's the kind of thing you're looking at. So they're coming. And we need to be prepared. We need to be thinking about it. We need to be, be thinking more. If, if you don't use GPS or you use GPS, GNSS sparingly, you need to start to think about it. <coughs> Either getting into it or be lucky like me <laughs> Other than that, you're done. So, um, the new realization is going to be through GNSS, and NGS is going to provide the tools. Questions? Yes? How long before FEMA adopts this? I had that question the last time I gave this talk. Um, fortunately, FEMA and NGS are working much, much closer together than they ever have in the past. And I really have confidence that it's all going to come together in 2022. There is a, there is a much better integration between NGS and FEMA. Anything else? Yes, sir. You mentioned subsidence. Is there any sort of accumulated knowledge 
of subsidence, uh, let's say here in Brevard County, Florida, with respect to benchmarks that are out there. Lots of us go to a known benchmark, we run from that and with, without ever thinking about subsidence. If it's convenient, of course, we tie into another yeah. benchmark. But again, it's expensive. Um, no, there is nothing that I know of that would give us any kind of a hint as to what the subsidence is. Um, you could look at the history of the core stations, which would give you some indication, but it's only going to be in the area of that particular core station. Uh, there was a, a line run from Pensacola to Natchez, Mississippi by the Mississippi DOT. They ran up all through Alabama and all the way across the state. And some of the differences that were found there were as much as 40 centimeters. And, and interestingly enough, it wasn't all down. <laughs> now, the up wasn't 40 centimeters, but some of them actually went up. And, and, and as you know, that, that area of the Gulf Coast is, is known for subsidence. Um, and the, but, you know, from Pensacola east, Florida is relatively stable. But they ran from that tide station in Pensacola to get started to all over the edges. Any, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it.